Hi, everybody. Um, today I'm going to be talking about something that I'm quite passionate about and something that hopefully after this speech you'll also find quite interesting. I'm going to be talking about nuclear fusion, more specifically about how it works and how it can be very important and beneficial to society in the future. Now, most, if not all of you already know, that there is an imminent crisis that is threatening our planet by the name of climate change. Now, this crisis has been caused by several different factors, one of which is the manner in which we as humans produce our energy. For long now, humanity has primarily been relying on fossil fuels to produce its energy. And although there have been some improvements over the past couple of decades uh, with regards to renewable energy sources and more eco-friendly energy sources, over three quarters of the total energy that's produced today globally still comes from fossil fuels, which shows that we are still far too reliant on these polluting and dangerous energy sources. Now, one of the reasons as to why nuclear fusion intrigues me so much is because it actually has the potential to greatly help us fight against climate change uh, whilst also producing energy and electricity at a very high rate. It is important to mention at this point that this speech will be an oversimplification of what nuclear fusion truly is, as nuclear fusion is something very detailed and very complex. Now, before I take this discussion any further, let me first talk about some of the basic concepts involved in nuclear fusion. Now, there are two types of nuclear reactions, fission reactions and fusion reactions. A fission reaction is basically when a large nucleus splits into two smaller nuclei whilst also releasing energy. A nucleus is basically the central part of the atom that contains protons and neutrons. So this diagram is very basic, but I hope you get the idea. Um, uh, and this is the nuclear reaction that has actually been used in traditional nuclear reactors over the past couple of decades. Now, nuclear fusion, on the other hand, is when two small nuclei fuse to form a larger nucleus whilst, again, also releasing energy. This is a basic diagram that I will explain further later on, but you get the idea of the two nuclei fusing together and releasing energy. The formula or the law that actually explains why these reactions release energy is actually something that you might have heard of, and it's the world famous E equals MC squared equation. And put in simple terms, if the mass of the reactants is larger than the mass of the products, then the reaction will end up releasing energy. Nuclear fusion is actually the process that powers stars such as our sun. So it's clear that its energy producing capabilities are very high. However, what's also true is that Earth is incomparable to our sun. And thus, uh, some of the conditions that are required for nuclear fusion are very, very difficult to achieve here on Earth. Now, there are two key conditions that have to be met in order for nuclear fusion to actually occur here on Earth. The first condition is that the reactions have to occur under extremely high pressures. I'm talking millions and millions and millions of degrees Celsius. In fact, the reactions have to occur in something called plasma. Now, plasma is basically a very hot gas, um, and it's the fourth fundamental state of matter. Plasma consists of delocalized electrons and positively charged nuclei. And in a fusion reactor, plasma will be heated to, again, as I said, tens of millions of degrees Celsius. Um, and the very high temperatures actually help overcome the very strong repellent electrostatic forces that um, are between the two positively charged nuclei. Because there is this basic concept in physics and in chemistry and in anything that involves charges that pretty much states that when you have two of the same charge, let's say positive and positive or negative and negative, they will repel each other, whilst when you have two opposite charges, like negative and positive, they will attract each other. So in this case, as we have two positively charged nuclei, under normal conditions, uh, the reaction will not occur because the force will just uh, repel them. However, the extremely high temperatures help overcome that force and fuse the two together. The second condition that has to be met is extremely high pressures. Now, this one is more self-explanatory because obviously, if you have fusion fuel dispersed all over the place and if you have particles nowhere near each other, then no reaction can occur. And thus, it's important to keep uh, the reaction or the fuel, sorry, uh, dense and confined enough in order for fusion to occur. Now, the fusion fuel that will actually most likely be used in fusion reactors in the future is a mixture of deuterium and tritium, which are two isotopes of hydrogen. Normally, a hydrogen nucleus simply contains one proton. However, deuterium and tritium simply have one or two extra neutrons on top of that. You can actually see that here. Uh, N's are neutrons, and uh, the letter P uh, represents protons. So you can see that you have tritium with two neutrons and one proton, and deuterium with uh, a neutron and a proton. And um, 
basically, in a fusion reactor, this reaction will occur, so they will fuse together, and that will lead to a helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons, a very high energy and high speed neutron that will be released, and obviously a lot of energy, as I stated. Now, there are two uh, main ideas that are currently being proposed to turn nuclear fusion into a reality here on Earth. The first idea is magnetic confinement fusion, which basically revolves around magnetic fields containing the plasma and allowing fusion to occur. A magnetic field is pretty much just a field that enacts a magnetic force on an electric charge, current, or on a magnetic material. The second idea is inertial confinement fusion, which is basically when strong lasers or particle beams compress a small pellet of fusion fuel. You can almost view this as like a little ball of fusion fuel. And those lasers uh, and particle beams will compress that little pellet to such high densities that fusion will actually occur. Now, I won't go into too much more detail because that will bore you and it will move away from the purpose of this speech, which is just to give you a basic understanding. Um, there have been many experiments and projects designed over, um, over the past couple of decades designed to test nuclear fusion and to potentially turn it into a successful method of producing energy here on Earth. None of these experiments have been quite as ambitious as the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER for short. This reactor is located in the south of France, and it's actually a collaboration between several different countries. This reactor is actually an example of a tokamak, which I know this diagram is very scary, but it, 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 you know, it's pretty simple. Um, but yeah, the experimental reactor is actually an example of a tokamak, uh, which is the most popular and promising design currently uh, for magnetic confinement fusion. And you can see here uh, some of the components on it. So you can see some of the magnetic field components. You can see um, the vessel, the plasma, the helium, the deuterium and tritium. So you can see, you can have a look uh, for yourselves. Um, construction for this reactor is currently ongoing. And in fact, it's actually quite a long way from being fully operational. In fact, first plasma is not due until 2035. So you can see that we're pretty far away from achieving fusion uh, here in this experimental reactor. However, if everything does go according to plan, then the reactor is projected to turn 50 megawatts of input heating power into 500 megawatts of thermal output power. Now, for comparison, your average two-slice toaster uses 1,000 watts. So basically, one of these reactors could power 500,000 of your toasters. That's just for comparison. Another way of looking at the sheer energy density inside of this reactor is by comparing fusion fuel to coal. Now, a 1,000 megawatt coal power plant consumes 2.7 million tons of coal every single year, whilst the envisioned prototypes of nuclear reactors for the future are projected to just use 250 kilos per year. So you can see how enormous the difference is in energy density between coal power plants and nuclear reactors. However, the statistics that I mentioned previously can be a bit misleading because the 50 megawatts of input power that I mentioned only touches upon heating input power, um, and that's only a fraction of the total power required. ITER itself states that the reactor requires between 100 and 600 megawatts of power to keep the reactor going at all times. Moreover, the reactor will not actually produce any electricity as it is an experimental reactor. In other words, the 500 megawatt output will not go anywhere. It will just stay there. Obviously, such a massive project doesn't come without a massive price tag. Um, in fact, ITER is a multinational mega project that costs around $20 billion. So you can see that that is a very hefty price tag. Now, some will tell you that spending this much money on one singular project that might not even lead to success is a waste of time, resources, and money. However, I am here to tell you otherwise. The reason as to why I brought up ITER earlier is because it's a very good baseline for what we can expect from nuclear fusion in the future. Obviously, at the moment, it has a lot of downsides. Uh, for one, it is very resource consuming as it requires a lot of water for cooling, which I think, yeah, you can see uh, the pipes over there labeled. But yeah, it requires a lot of water for cooling, a lot of electricity and power to keep the reactor going, and a lot of construction materials because obviously this is a mega project. It's also very expensive, as I previously touched upon. Uh, and there are also, on top of this, some issues with radioactivity that can be dangerous. The first of these issues is the fact that some of the components of this reactor can actually become radioactive over time because of the high energy neutron that I previously touched upon, this guy. So 
uh, when this high energy neutron collides with, these, with the components of this reactor, over time, these components can become radioactive, which is dangerous. And the second issue with radioactivity is that tritium, which was one of the uh, reactants for this reaction, is actually a radioactive isotope. And thus, uh, it can be dangerous and it's very difficult, very difficult to handle, sorry. However, with all of those downsides being mentioned and with all of that being said, I still do think that there is an upside to all of this. For one, the radioactivity issue I mentioned with uh, the neutron collisions is actually something a lot less severe than what was seen in fission reactors. So I don't want you thinking that this energy source is as bad as the fission reactor radioactivity, because that would simply be wrong. Secondly, this energy source does not produce any greenhouse gases, and thus it can be very important, as I mentioned earlier, in our fight against climate change. Thirdly, most of the reactants are abundant in nature, and tritium, which is the only exception, can actually be produced within the reactor via an interaction between a neutron and a lithium atom. And finally, and most importantly, this is a brand new energy source, which in my book is a plus. Let me explain myself. Now, as this is a completely new energy source, it means that the best is still ahead of us. In other words, all of the technological developments that haven't been made yet will most likely be made sometime in the future, and thus those can contribute into this energy source becoming more efficient, more productive, less environmentally impactful. Furthermore, our understanding and comprehension of this energy source will, again, improve over time, right? So uh, we're going to come up with better solutions, we're going to come up with better results, and it's only going to get better over time. Thus, I think that with uh, the fact that we haven't even seen the best of this energy source yet, it would be unwise to already judge that it's, um, that it's overrated or that its use is limited. Um, and I think that we should still give this energy so source a shot. I think we should try it out as it can lead to great success. And yeah, thank you for your attention. I really do hope that you took something away from our discussion today and that uh, nuclear fusion uh, well, you're more interested in it than before. So yeah, thank you.